Just talk about Ladies and gentlemen, Mark Metcalf. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> so me and uh, we'll, we'll start off here. Me and Mark are going to just have a little bit of discussion. We'll talk about some things. Um, and then we're going to open the floor for you guys. That's why the microphone's there. Okay, I will let you know when we're going to get ready to do that so you guys can start to line up and we'll go from there, okay? Make sure you guys have some questions ready because we're going to want them. So the first thing I want to start with with regards to um, basically starting towards the beginning is um, Animal House. Uh -huh. I mean, obviously, it was kind of your first big break and the first thing that you were doing. Right. Um, how, were you actually familiar with, the, with what the Lampoon had done before that film, before getting into that film? I was, I was not particularly aware. I was aware of the Lampoon. I was aware of the Harvard Lampoon because I'd had actor friends who'd gone to Harvard. And I was aware of the National Lampoon, but not, not in a passionate way. I had met John Belushi the year before when he was, I was, it's a funny story actually, I was uh, with my girlfriend Pamela Reed who's an actress and a friend of mine John Hurd who's an actor who died now and his girlfriend Patrizia Triana, a great Cuban woman who I'm still in touch with. We were having a picnic in Central Park waiting to go see a play at uh, Shakespeare in the Park and we, they'd made fried chicken and potato salad and all kinds of, and this big guy, uh, real hairy guy comes walking <laughs> towards us and John Hurd had spent some time in Chicago and with his sister Cordis and he knew John Belushi and it was John Belushi. He said, hey John, come over here, sit down. And this was before Saturday Night Live. So John Belushi sits down, we say, have some chicken, have some uh, potato salad. Uh, what are you doing? And he said, oh, they got me here, I'm auditioning. I can't do a good John Belushi imitation, but he, <laughs> he started into this routine, this, uh, this rant about how they wanted him to do television and they wanted him to do live TV. And he's a, he's a sketch comedy and an improv comedy actor and he didn't want to do this and he didn't want to do TV. TV was the root of all evil. It was a, the worst thing about what, what was, it was taking this country down the drain. And, talked about how he'd been in to see this guy, Lorne Michaels, and he told Lorne Michaels he didn't want to do TV, and he didn't want to work within the system. He was a rebel, he was a revolutionary. And uh, uh, Lorne Michaels said, well, work within the system. And he said, I don't know, he would tell, tell he, oh, should I do this thing or not? I don't know what it's calling Saturday night, they're gonna call it. I don't know whether I should do it or not. And we said, John, listen, it's, I mean, they're paying the American money, <laughs> and uh, it's a chance to be funny, uh, go, do this thing for heaven's sakes go and he said all right all right and he went on and wandered away and we looked down and we realized he'd eaten all the fried chicken <laughs> and all the potato salad it was all gone all while he was he was doing all the talking and he was eating at the same time that was my first and the next time i met him was on the set in eugene oregon when uh, when we did the movie <laughs> i can't even remember what the question was <laughs> uh, uh, we just uh. It's okay, I think we're good there. Um, but I've heard stories of what happened on that set is that they basically kept like you and Kevin Bacon and the other ROTC guys and stuff intentionally away from the Deltas so that you guys weren't... Well, it, it's so, they, it, it ended up like that. What they did was what John Landis did, which was a stroke of genius. Two, a couple of things he did that were really, really smart. One, Universal wanted to have, wanted it to be the Saturday Night Live movie and they wanted Chevy to do the uh, Tim Matheson part, they wanted uh, Danny Aykroyd to do D-Day uh, or to do my part and, and Landis didn't want that. He, he really fought really hard to have all just actors, unknown people, because he wanted to create this environment for John Belushi so he wasn't distracted by all people he knew and by routines he could get into. So he really had to work as an actor and not as a comic because he wanted, Landis understood that this would work best as a real ensemble piece rather than a star vehicle. Now, what was the question again? Uh, I'm, about I'm forgetting a lot. Kind, about know. them keeping you guys separated. So oh, and so he, what he did to help create that ensemble is he got all the deltas there uh, about five days early. And uh, just to bond, they went to a, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they went to a, a fraternity party where they almost, well, a couple of them, McGill did get hit in the face enough times that he had to do 
makeup to cover a black eye, <laughs> and uh, Jamie Widows chipped a tooth because they invited him into this fraternity, the kind of jock fraternity, the Omega kind of fraternity, and then they closed the door and they proceeded to harass him and say, you wimps from L.A. coming up here and steal our women, we're not going to let you do this. You've got to get out of town right now. And uh, a fight ensued. Uh, but I came later. Kevin came much later. Uh, uh, Marmalard, Greg Marmalard, Jimmy Doughton. Yeah. He came a later. The best, my, my personal story about it is I got off the plane. I flew out with Karen Allen. By the time I got to Eugene, I never met her before, but by the time I got to Eugene, I was uh, completely in love with her, because <laughs> why wouldn't you be? Look at her. And uh, I went to production office, which is what you do first when you get on the set. You go to production office, get your per diem, just in case they change their mind, at least you've got some cash <laughs> so you can get out of town. And Peter McGregor Scott, the production manager, said, all right, leave your stuff here. John Landis is in the coffee shop on the other side of the parking lot from the roadway in, uh, where, where the production office is, he wants to see you. He's over there with some of the guys having lunch. Go on over. So I go into this, I walk across, leave my stuff, walk across the parking lot, go into the, road, into the coffee shop. It's a crowded coffee shop. It's around lunchtime. I look around, and John is uh, at a booth in the corner with a bunch of people around him. And I knew McGill from bars in New York. Too many bars. <laughs> I knew... Uh, uh, Peter Riegert kind of vaguely from just around, because he'd worked for Bella Abzug. He was a big political guy, as well as being uh, uh, some uh, improv group. Anyway, so Landis waves at me and says, come on over. So I'm walking through this crowded coffee shop, first day in Eugene, Oregon, on the set, uh, still not, sh not convinced that they're not going to look at me and say, no, you're not the Mark Metcalf we want. Go home. And I get about 10 feet from the table, and Landis points at me, and he says, that's him, that's Niedermeyer, get him. And they start screaming at me and yelling at me and throwing food at me <laughs> and completely you know, humiliating me in front of this whole thing. So I understood instantly what was going on and that I was to be the enemy and they were to be the heroes. I sat down and had lunch because it was all fun, but then I had the hotel... McGill stole a piano from the office of the roadway inn and pushed it across the parking lot to his room. His room became party central. And uh, I had the hotel move my room so it was right above his room so that I would have to live with these guys having a good time down below. And I would stay up all night, because I couldn't sleep, because they were making so much noise, having so much fun. I would stay up studying my script and spit polishing my boots, my riding boots, all night getting madder and madder and madder. It was my method actor way of getting into character. So yes, they did separate us, but we separated ourselves too, just because we understood that that's how the relationship would work. And if we were you know, always sort of eyeing each other and jockeying around each other, that tension that's on the screen uh, would be stronger if it was also in the hallways, so yeah, so yeah. we did. And that no, must not that we weren't friends, but yeah, it exactly. must have been quite the experience, though. When you look back now at all of the talent that was just emerging from that one picture, it yeah, was, I mean, Reitman and Landis, and oh, it, it just the, yeah. the amazing talent that was behind the it camera. There was a lot of lot of people. The writing, it started out with the writing, what Doug Kenny created, and then uh, Harold and Chris sort of helped polish, and Landis helped polish, and Ivan did as a producer. Um, and then all the actors who, I mean, nobody went on to sort of, a, well, Kevin's had a pretty spectacular career. Tom Hulse. Huh? Tom Hulse, yeah. Tommy Hulse, yeah, he had, he, and he's, he, he now doesn't do any of this stuff because he's a producer and a, a, a writer for uh, Broadway plays Stephen, and musicals. Stephen yeah. First was on St. Elsewhere for years. I mean, yeah. I mean, a lot of guys. Oh, and Stephen was, stuff. yeah, Stephen was great. He's, he passed this year, which is yeah, very, very sad. sad. But, uh, great guy. That's kind of, uh, was, that must have been, that must have been, uh, there's just that entire energy must have been kind of crazy. Well, it was. I mean, it, it, 40 years later, and we're still talking about it, that doesn't happen a lot. Uh, they still quote it on the floor of the Senate every once in a while. <laughs> uh, uh, that's what they have to do. That's how much they know. But uh, so it is, it was a, 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 one of those moments in creative moments where the script, 
the director, all the actors, everything came together and everybody got along. There weren't any egos yeah. to push against or to fight against. It was all, it, it, it was, yeah, it was a, a so, magic moment. Um, for, I don't know if everybody here knows anything about Doug Kenny, but Doug Kenny was kind of this oddball, insane creative force. I mean, he, he was behind uh, Animal House. He also wrote Caddyshack. Caddyshack, yeah. And so, um, what was Kenny like in person? Because I've heard stories of him just being this insanely random person. Well, he wasn't. I mean, I'm sure he was uh, at times. We all get that way if we take too many chemicals, <laughs> uh, which he was capable of doing. They just threw it at you, mountains of the stuff. Um, but he was on set. He was great. He was, he was an actor in it too. He plays uh, Dork, yes, the guy who says, "What do you want us to do, you moron?" <laughs> and uh, and he really dug that. Now, he uh, uh, Universal wouldn't pay to have the writers on set. They were they wanted this movie. They hated this movie. They wanted it to be didn't want to spend any money on it. So John Landis said, "If you can get yourselves to Eugene, Oregon." I'll put you in the movie. So he had him, he wrote these parts, Dork, and Chris Miller plays Hardbar, the guy who's at the card table playing cards at the, in the early scene when they fir Flounder and uh, Pinto first come, and um, so he was he was loving acting, he was loving being around this. It was the first time, so he was very focused and very good. Now, he and I spent a good deal of time talking because he saw. There just was a movie on Netflix called A Feudal and Stupid Gesture, which yes. was kind of the story of Doug Kenny based on a book. And in, in the movie and in the book, it, it states that uh, Doug Kenny's brother died when Doug was probably 12 or 13 or 14, something like that, his older brother. His older brother was the golden boy. He was the guy who was going to do everything perfectly. And he died, I don't exactly remember how, but it was yeah. accidental and tragic. and and. Doug always said to me, anyway, that he felt that Niedermeyer, for him, in some way represented his brother for him in this script. I don't know how, but somehow the fact that he said that to me gave me, rather than just playing everybody thinks he's the bad guy, I just think he's misunderstood, yeah. but rather than playing just sort of the nemesis, I was able to play a real human being who played, I mean, I was able to work on playing a real human being who was related to somebody who meant something, to somebody who came to mean something to me. Because Doug was a, uh, I guess, I mean, he wasn't a, a close friend, but he was a friend for that time. But he did, uh, he went down hard too. Like a lot of people went down hard in those days. There was a lot of stuff to, yeah. to so take you down. So of course, after after Animal House comes out and the massive success it is, you kind of you you get an opportunity to do these music videos with Twisted Sister. Yeah. And yeah. and I'm, you can clearly tell that they obviously were fans of the movie and basically wanted Niedermeyer as an adult. Right. So I mean, those must have been a lot of fun to, to do. They they were fun to do. I didn't. They called me, they found, somehow tracked me down, and I lived in the Lower East Side in Manhattan, was acting in plays all the time and doing movies if people wanted me to do them, but mostly interested in the theater, which is still mostly what I like to do. And they tracked me down, and they had, they, they loved the character, they used to quote his lines and bars up and down the Hudson River and on Long Island, and they had me, they flew me out, I said, I was doing a play, I, I'm off Sunday after, I do a matinee Sunday, so you could fly me out Sunday night. I do a show Wednesday. I'm off Monday and Tuesday. If you can get me out there, we can shoot this thing. I pick up some stuff that I left at an old girlfriend's house, and uh, I can be back home and able to do the show on Wednesday. If you can do that, great. They paid me a day's wage, SAG scale. It wasn't a SAG Screen Actors Guild union gig. It was a, just a non-union gig. I got in trouble for that. and. When I got off the plane, Dee Snyder met me. I'd never met him. I didn't have a TV. I didn't know what MTV was. As, as soon as, after Beethoven died, I stopped paying attention to popular music. <laughs> so I didn't know who Twisted Sister was. But this big, ugly, blonde guy <laughs> with long hair uh, met me at the airport, and he was like a big puppy dog, such a nice guy, sweet guy, and such a fan. 
And he drove me in to, they, they didn't even have a hotel for me. I slept on Marty Kallner, who was the director's couch in his, uh, in his little studio. But uh, Dee said, as we drove me, he said, okay, it's like, kind of like a Roadrunner cartoon, and we blow you through windows, you'll do lots of stunts and stuff like that, but, but to open the whole thing, we want you yelling at your son, so you gotta write that. So I went home. I went home, I went to visit a friend, have dinner with a friend of mine, a guy named Rex Weiner, who's a writer, wrote Fair, Ford Fairlane, which is a Andrew Dice Clay yeah. vehicle. Um, and he and I spent the evening drinking and writing and eating and wrote this whole thing that I scream that ends up with, what do you want to do with your life? Uh, D had said, the only thing about whatever you write, it has to end with, what do you want to do with your life? So we can say, I want to rock and go into the, into the song. And uh, so all those lines, a sick elect, I, I carried an M16 in the war, you carry that, that, that electric twanger. <laughs> um, all of that stuff is stuff that, uh, that Rex and I wrote. So I worked hard for my $370, <laughs> uh, wrote this thing. Those guys, within about a year, the play, thing played every five minutes, as I said, on MTV. Those guys were living in big houses with indoor pools and indoor gyms, and I was still living in a fifth floor walk up in the Lower East Side on St. Mark's Place. But I'm not bitter. <laughs> uh, but I did, in terms of Animal House, it, it, um, it got me in trouble because I got a letter from Universal after I'd done the first one, and just, it was like six or eight months after I'd done the first one. Universal, got, I got a letter in the mail from Universal that said, you cannot do that character. We own that character. You don't own that character. You were paraphrasing lines. If you do it again, we will sue you. I also got a letter from the union saying, if you do that again, a non-union gig, we'll throw you out of the union. So I got a letter from the union saying, we'll throw you out. I got a letter from Universal saying, if you do it again, we'll sue you. A couple of weeks later, a month later, I got a call from D saying, hey, we're gonna make another video. You wanna do it? I said, yeah, sure. <laughs> So it was fun, and they never sued me, and they never threw me out of the union. I hope they're not <laughs> listening now. But um, there's a, a film that's actually a personal favorite of mine that you were in that I want to talk about, other than Animal House. Oasis, no. No, um, it was a film called One Crazy Summer. Oh, yeah. That you did with uh, Savage Steve Holland and uh, John, the John, director, Cusack. John Cusack. Demi Moore, before Moore. she had breasts, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Um, and and Bobcat Goldthwait in yeah. the Godzilla costume, yeah. stomping on a tiny city. <laughs> I, I, I have no screaming idea. as he always did. I yeah. have no idea how any of you guys were able to keep a straight face long enough to actually film <laughs> scenes in that movie. Well, we're professionals. I <laughs> know uh, it was a funny movie. It was fun to make too, because uh, Savage Steve Holland, which is his name, uh, who directed it had made a movie called Better Off Dead yes. with John. It hadn't even come out yet, but Warner Brothers liked it so much, they said, here's, I can't remember how much, it was like $10 million or something like that, which was a lot of money in those, what was that, 1986 yeah. or something? In those days. Uh, we want you to make another movie. So he gave him $10 million, and he didn't even have a script. He didn't, so he said, well, where would I like to spend the summer? And he used to spend summer as a kid on Nantucket, so we didn't shoot on Nantucket because it's too crowded an island and they would have put us in jail probably. But uh, we shot in Falmouth, some on Nantucket, some uh, uh, in Hyannis and some in Falmouth. But uh, he, so we just sort of dreamt up, uh, wrote it on the back of an envelope, this yeah. story of, of one crazy summer of a guy who has a, well, I always think of it from my point of view, a guy who has a, a chain of lobster restaurants and <laughs> whatever else it's about. I don't know what the love story is. But uh, yeah, the yeah. the uh, there's so many iconic moments for me in that. I felt like the the wheel of the lobsters with oh. the, <laughs> shooting <laughs> with, with the, with crossbow. the crossbow. <laughs> oh, it's too much. It, um, oh, and, and Bill Hickey, who played my father, oh, great God. great character yeah. actor. I mean, and you also, I mean, at the same at that time, obviously, John Cusack, Better Off Dead, hadn't done a lot, and Demi Moore had done no. next to nothing. Yeah. But uh, you, they they pop in Curtis Armstrong from Re the Revenge of the Nerd, from Boyfriends of the Nerd, as one of the supporting guys. Right. And they change, they totally 
put him against type. Like he's this is the meek, mild-mannered guy when he's the complete opposite of what he did in Nerds, which was I thought was brilliant. Yeah, I yeah. Well, it. they yeah, it was a lot, and Jeremy Piven's in it. Yeah, Joe Flaherty. Joe Flaherty oh. came down, right? Yeah, I mean they put they they picked a, they put a lot of good people in it. They a really lot of people did. who just again, as in Animal House, people who just enjoyed the work and weren't there to uh, to make them you know make them feel better about themselves. They just liked the work. Yeah, I mean I. Yeah, I, I, sorry. I'm just, I'm still gushing. I love that movie so much. I still watch really? it. It's so good. Um, in the '90s, you then get offered kind of another what had became an iconic role on one of the biggest television shows in history in Seinfeld yeah. as the maestro. Yeah. So I mean, walking on to that cast and the, with that, on that set with that cast when they're right there at the height of their popularity. Yeah, it was the been, seventh season, I think they were. They were making six hundred thousand dollars an episode. Yeah. Four days work, they had it down to a science. Great writing. Yeah, yeah. It, it must have been just, it, A, it could, I, I imagine it possibly even could be a bit intimidating to having to walk into that atmosphere. Well, it wasn't that much because I'd never watched the show. <laughs> I, had, I had heard of it, and I heard it was good, but, I, but it, again, I'm a professional, so yeah. I'm not impressed. But also, I think, I don't know what it is. The, the, the negative way of looking at it is that my ego is so big that I don't think anybody is as interesting as I am. So I wasn't fascinated by them. Yeah. But the positive way of looking at it is, is it, was, it was a job. I, I had probably seen the show once or twice, so I understood how it worked yeah. and uh, what made it funny. What, uh, Alec, uh, not Alec Guinness, but John Gilgood, a great English Shakespearean actor, uh, once said that knowing that style is knowing what kind of play you're in, and it's true of television series or anything. You've got to know what the sensibility of the creator is, so that you can fit yourself into that into that world. Because it's a, it's a different world. It's a different way language is used. It's a different way gesture is used. And so you. So I I watched enough of it so that I knew what they wanted. I knew it was a show about nothing. So I knew how to how to behave in that universe, and it's always good to work with millionaires. <laughs> the guy I've done a, I did not a lot of them, but I did several of those half-hour sitcoms. Yeah, and inevitably, when you're rehearsing it before you perform it in front of the the live audience on Thursday night, inevitably the guys in suits from the tower, the Black Rock, or wherever they happen to hide come down and uh, look in to see if you're being as funny as they're paying you to be. But on Seinfeld, those guys came down, they walked in the door, everybody stopped, Larry David stopped, uh, Ackerman, the director stopped, Jerry stopped, uh, Jason stopped, everybody stopped and looked at him and just looked at him. And Jerry, I think it was, said, can we help you? And they said, oh, no, that's all right, thank you, bye. They just backed out because they knew that they had no business there because those guys knew what they were doing. They're smart guys. I mean, David, Larry David's still going. Jerry's still, yeah. very, he's the godfather of comedy now. He's got that Netflix show too, the huh? com Comedians in Cars. Oh, yeah, Comedians in Cars Getting Coffee. Yeah. 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 So um, I'm, I'm interested to see what um, the pitch kind of was, or at least your reaction to the pitch was when they came to you um, with regards to Buffy. Because we here we've got a show that's a spin-off from a movie that was kind of successful, but not really. Yeah. By an, Joss hated it. By, by an upstart director who really hadn't done anything at that point in time, who's now one of the most po powerful men in yeah. Hollywood. Yeah. Um, and it's on a upstart network that is just starting out. Right. And, you're, and, you're, and, you're, and, you're, and on top of all of this, all of your scenes are in a full prosthetic face makeup. <laughs> yeah. Five hours of makeup to put at the beginning of the season, five hours to get, because they didn't know what colors they wanted. They didn't know what color they wanted it to be, so they would did a death mask, and then they built the foam pieces out of uh, from the death mask. So that was already, and I, they would just apply that, and it was a face piece, a neck piece, a skull cap, and two ears, and then the nails were the final thing. But they had to meld that, and then they would paint it. That's why it took five hours. By the end of the season, they knew if you look at it, you don't see that, I think, fruit punch mouth or punch bowl mouth, whatever it is. It grows, because it, that, that was something we came to. And I would, you know, they would let me kibitz, uh, you know, sort of throw in my two cents or my $10 worth 
as they made it, as they painted it. That was the advantage of being there at 4 o'clock in the morning. The only advantage of being there at 4 o'clock <laughs> is that I could have some influence on, yeah. on what it looked like. So, uh, yeah, so wearing all of that, the funniest story I think about the makeup is the nails. Once the nails were applied, you could take them off and reapply them, but it was a pain in the ass because they were glued on and everything. So I couldn't go to the bathroom because I couldn't, and it was button, a button fly pair of trousers. So I had to go to the wardrobe room and they gave me a young woman who was very nice and uh, she would help me get out of my pants and go to the bathroom. <laughs> And keep and she was wonderful because she kept it from being as awkward as it could have been. <laughs> so, um, but it was. I mean, yeah. it was great to be in the first season that because the writing was obviously good, yeah. but nobody knew it was going to be a hit, so nobody had that added thing of of oh, we have to protect what we've done, which happens after you get going a few seasons and you have a hit, you have to try to hit that mark again or top yourself again. When you're just making it from scratch. You just, you just get to have fun and make it as good as you possibly can. And like you say, Joss is a genius, a great bunch of actors who none of which, I mean, Sarah had done soap operas since yeah. she was, I don't know, in diapers probably. Yeah. But uh, so she'd had a lot of experience, but nobody else was particularly the, well known. The only other one, well, I mean, Anthony Stewart Head was known in the yeah, UK, he, but he wasn't. He'd known. done all those coffee commercials. Yeah, hadn't he? He, yeah. he'd known in the UK. He wasn't really known in in, yeah. in America at all. Yeah. So um, I'm gonna. I got one more here that I'm gonna follow up with, but then I'm gonna be turning to you guys. So sure. if you wanna get your questions ready, we're gonna be going to you guys in a minute. You can just hop up on the microphone here. Um, but it must have been kind of cool then. Um, after seeing that show develop and grow and kind of f feeling that you were probably done with that character when in season five they call you to come back uh, for that little one-off to kind of just... On the, the, yeah, the wish or something? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, that was fun when I came back for that because I, I get to win then. <laughs> when, when I got the point, Josh cast me in the part. I had to audition, I think, uh, three times. And the, the casting director told me later that the reason she brought me in is because she could not figure out what Joss wanted. He was a very articulate guy, but somehow he couldn't communicate to her exactly what he wanted, and she'd been bringing the wrong people in because nothing was working. So she thought, all right, what I'll do is I'll bring the opposite of what I think he wants in, <laughs> and I'll bracket it down. But it turned out that I, he liked what I did because I had a a kind of a sardonic, sarcastic, slightly delivery that's just, on the, which, is, which is very much about how he works, how he writes, which I saw and I did that. And so when he finally, after three auditions and finally got cast, he, he and I sat down and talked and I said, so what's the arc of this character? Well, I know he goes through the season, not in every episode, but through I think eight or 10 of the 12 episodes. What's the arc of where does it end up? And he said, it's really great because in the last episode, you kill Buffy. And I said, oh, wow, that's nice. So if it gets picked up, does that mean the second season will be called Master the Buffy Slayer? <laughs> and he said, well, we'll see. He didn't tell me that they raise her from the dead and she comes and turns me into dust. But um, so anyway. <laughs> All right, guys, it's your turn. Who's got some questions? Yeah. Step up to the mic so we can yeah, all absolutely. hear Absolutely. Oh, an angel. Yeah, then I came back and did Angel, How I Made Darla. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And I was supposed to be, just a second, I'll finish that. I, I, yeah. for, uh, I did a little bit where I flew out for a day to do a thing in the beginning of the last season, which is season seven, right? Yes. And I was supposed to do an entire episode that was all going to be about the master at the end of season seven. But when they called me and said, we need you out here next week. I said, I can't, I'm doing a play. And I couldn't leave the play, I was doing a play in Milwaukee, I was living in Milwaukee at the time. So they rewrote it and changed it because they don't change their schedule. They expected me to change my schedule. They didn't know who they were dealing with. They were dealing with an idiot. <laughs> and apparently, actually somebody told me later, Josh Whedon was very mad that I didn't drop that play and come out and do it. That's why I haven't worked for him since, I guess. Oh well. 
I yeah. was wondering if you can answer my question about this. There is one scene in Animal House that I nearly vomit from laughing so hard at. It's when they're reading off the midterm grades <laughs> and they're going through, you got zero point this, uh, right. some, and then they get up to Blutarski and he has two pencils up his nose. Mr. Blutarski, zero point zero. Were those two pencils part of the script or is that an improvised scene? It's not, it was, if it was improvised, it was improvised not when we were shooting. We didn't, we shot everything really tight. We didn't have very much money. So we, everything was one take or two takes. It may have been improvised in, uh, in rehearsal. When you, you, the way you shoot it, you come in and you rehearse for lights and camera to see where the camera's gonna be once or twice. Then you go out and get your makeup touched up and then you come back and shoot it. We literally shot everything in between one to four takes because we were shooting fast. So it may have been improvised, and I don't remember from the script, but it's such a classic of, and even before that, of having sticking pencils up your nose, that it may have been something that uh, Doug Kenny or, or Harold put in because they knew it would be cut to Belushi, and he's got pencils up his nose, so of course he does. <laughs> and I think it is Mr. Blutarski has no grade point average. No, it was, it was Daniel Simpson Day was the one who had no. Oh, he has all, okay. all classes incomplete. Okay, that's right. And he's kind of like mm, whatever. Oh, yeah, okay, that's but, right. But uh, because I was, I was always told that Belushi and Bill Murray are the two actors in Hollywood that are allowed to play around with the script a little bit, and that upset Richard Dreyfuss when he made What About Bob. Oh, I bet it did. Yeah, Billy, so. Billy does. I know. I made a movie with Billy called uh, uh, Where the Buffalo Roam yes. about. Yes. Um, Hunter Thompson. Hunter Thompson yeah. And I know he goes off script and wherever he wants to go and has to be brought <laughs> back. Um, John on this movie, as you, if you notice, he doesn't have very many lines. Well, it's mostly, it's 70% physical, and he's got, you know, the big line about you know, when the Germans bombed um, Pearl Harbor and stuff <laughs> like that. Um, but he, 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 we didn't, as I say, because we were shooting fast, and because John Landis was smart and cast a lot of actors around John Belushi, he was doing a lot of acting. I mean, he was really doing what the actor's work is and not what the improv comics work is. I mean, he would improvise as he worked on the script and took it very seriously. He was also really tired because, and, and focused because he was flying back every Thursday to New York City to do Saturday Night Live. He'd come back to us on Sunday and go to work. So he worked Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with us, and then he'd fly back Thursday night, I think. Oh, wow. Yeah. So he was... That was a grueling schedule. That was a grueling schedule. And he was... And because of that, he was really focused and taking good care of himself. And he didn't... To my... He impro we all improvised physically, and sometimes, but hardly ever... I mean, now they do it more and more because there's so many improv comics leading, doing the leading parts in movies. So they do a lot of improv. But in those days, we didn't do much improv. We stuck to the script. We had a couple of read-throughs and we added a few lines, but we always asked permission if we could add a line. I added the line, uh, let's see, when, when Boone is walking across in front of, I'm sitting out there with my cigarette holder, uh, how's it feel to be an independent, Sean Steen? Like <laughs> and he says, how's it feel to be an asshole, Niedermeyer? And I say, what did he say? That was improvised. And I think Oh, Peter Rieger, uh, you know, when Matheson pulls the dildo, the big, like, 20-inch <laughs> dildo out of his uh, bag and says, uh, try this, she'll, she'll listen to this, or whatever he says, and Boone leads into it and says, does this thing talk? That was improvised, but in the audition between the two of them, and it was added into the oh, script. In. When, he, when he, Tim and Peter had auditioned together, I mean, they'd just been thrown together, they never met to audition to see how the chemistry between Boone and Otter would work, because that's a lot of what it is. And uh, they improvised a scene around this dildo. Landis tossed him a dildo and said, <laughs> so do something about the dildo. And uh, that came up there. I shouldn't be saying that word in front of children. <laughs> I actually, for when you first brought that up, I thought you were going to ask about the guitar scene. The, the <laughs> oh, the nose. Exactly. oh he, he wrote the, uh, he was a guitar player, he wrote the, uh, yeah. And it was supposed, the guitar had been scored and everything to break on the first hit against the wall. And I was with Steve in, in L.A. just a, about a month ago at uh, Turner Classic Movies. And um, 
He said it had been scored, but it didn't break, if you remember the scene. And Belushi just goes berserk and whack, whack, whack. <laughs> And Bishop was really terrified, he said. <laughs> Because he, he, that wasn't, you know, it was in the script that it was supposed to break the first time. So, and Belushi beats it up, yeah. Hello. Do you have a question? Hi. How are you? Do you want to bend that down to yourself? Or lift yourself up to it? <laughs> okay. So, um, how old? Right into the mic. How old were you when you filmed Buffy? How old was I when I played in Buffy? Well, the character is 800 years old. <laughs> I wasn't that old. <laughs> I don't know how old I was. When people ask how old I was when I made Animal House four years ago, I say I was five. <laughs> I'm stretching it a little bit. I don't know how old. 97, 97. Oh, I was probably 40 something, 50. I might have been, I don't know. <laughs> no, I think I was 40. How old was I? 97. <laughs> 76, 76, 76, 86, 90. God, I was 51. Okay. I looked pretty good for 51, though, didn't I? <laughs> yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, I just, I, I think it's really cool that I got to ask a question behind. How old are you? Behind someone How old is she? She's nine. <laughs> behind someone who's nine who knows about Buffy and, you know, I'm 35 and, and love Buffy, so this is super awesome. But um, my question, like you had mentioned earlier um, about being somewhat isolated from the cast of Animal House to right. kind of get into character a little bit, but did you feel like you did that with Buffy or because the master, aside from in the last episode, doesn't really have too much interaction with the other cast members, except for maybe the dream nightmare episode. Um, so do you feel like you, you kind of were? Well, I did voluntarily, but it was also practical because with all the makeup on and the nails, I couldn't do too much. I couldn't sit around and talk about the weather or how the Lakers were doing or anything like that because the teeth, I could put the teeth in and out so I could take them out, but I didn't want to talk too much or do too much because it was hot in Southern California and those, and I would sweat. I'd, so I I'd stayed in the air-conditioned trailer a lot. When I perspired, it would all kind of gather at the tip of my nose under the foam, <laughs> and I would have to go into makeup and they'd poke a hole in there and squeeze, milk my nose of all the sweat <laughs> to get it out, and then paint it over and latex it over and so cover it glamorous. in. So I did separate myself partly because he's living underground for 800 years with nothing but uh, his minions to talk to, no humans, and for that, but also out of just practicality, I needed to sort of stay as still as I could to preserve the makeup and everything. Hi, first of all, I love the Jabalushi story about eating the fried chicken. It um, reminds me of the, the way he was is he just made himself part of everything. He did, right. And he was, it was almost like in a later uh, sketch and sort of the thing that wouldn't leave just yeah. makes himself part of everything. Danny, uh, Danny called him America's guest. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Another great actor that I think steals Animal House is John Vernon, who comes across oh. as a very serious actor. Yeah. But I quote that movie all the time, constantly, and his lines come up all the time. Any memories of working with him? Yeah, no, he was, he was, John was great to work with. Landis says that two people, everybody usually says, did you know when you were making that movie it was going to be such a huge hit? We, none of us knew. We knew it was a good script. We knew we were having fun, but we didn't think that way. But John Vernon came to Landis in his very serious actor voice and with his serious actor face and said, do you know how important it is what you're doing here? This is a big, important movie. You be very careful with this movie. Really make it right. So he, and Landis said, yes, sir, yes, sir. But he saw, somehow, he saw in it, he'd been around Hollywood a lot longer than any of the rest of us, so he saw in it something that none of the other rest of us were looking for, uh, but he saw how pivotal it would be in terms of what c movie comedies were like. And he, like you say, he was a serious actor. He, Landis saw him in... Is it Hang 'em High or Dirty, uh, not Dirty Harry, some Clint Eastwood Western movie with this 
dark beard and those piercing blue eyes, and he <laughs> thought, that's the guy. He originally wanted, uh, Landis wanted Jack Webb to do it, the yeah, guy from yeah. Dragnet, but he tells the story about having lunch with Jack Webb, and Jack Webb finally threw his napkin on the table and walked out because he thought Landis was crazy, because <laughs> Landis is a highly energetic kind of guy. If you ever get a chance to sit and listen to him talk, do it, because yeah. he's very funny. I've seen some interviews. Thank you for that. Yeah, yeah thank you. Okay, so bear with me. I don't have a voice. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I went to a concert last night. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, Here. Uh, so. <clears throat> Lower that thing. Okay. I Let's can't. see if we can. <laughs> okay. Never mind you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. She loved one. She she loved one crazy summer too. I'll go back. To yep. Back. Fair enough. Uh, that's a good question. Um, it's interesting. That that sounds like an NPR response, doesn't it? Yes. That's a good question. Um, <laughs> It's, the question was, I've done comedy, and I've done serious stuff with Buffy, and I've done a lot of theater, a lot of Shakespeare, straight plays. What's my favorite thing to do? And I think you mean between comedy and drama. To me, and I think to most actors, I think, it's all the same. It's the same mechanism. Basically, you're trying to create a character and create a reality and create a relationship with whoever you're working with and with the audience at the same time, even though the audience isn't there when you're making a film or television. It's the same mechanism. It's the same way of searching. It's the same way of revealing yourself. And it's the same way of pushing up against the character and pushing up against the other forces there with you. Uh, comedy does take more precision. You can't make mistakes in comedy. Uh, you can make mistakes in dramatic plays like Arthur Miller, uh, Chekhov is supposed to be comedy, so it, it, but but the dramatic plays should if they they work better if they're if there's precision, real precision in them, and dramatic plays Hamlet works better if the audience gets to laugh once in a while, or a lot, laughs are dollars as we say in the mm -hmm. business, and uh, and I think comedy works better if the audience thinks that there's a real person there rather than a comedian. I mean, if you go to see a comedian, you may laugh at him. You see him in a, in a, in a part, you, see, you may laugh at him, but you're expecting it. This, the best laugh, and I think Animal House is filled with them, and it's why it succeeds 40 years later, are those surprise laughs that come yeah. out of the humanity of the character and the situation. For me, that's what that's what works. So uh, I know they're different, comedy and drama, yeah. and I know you do approach them finally different in performance, and that's mostly about precision, I think. But uh, the mechanism for the actor is pretty much the same. You're really trying to breathe life into, and this sounds hokey, but you're really mm -hmm. trying to breathe some life into a, hu into a human being and out of airy nothing, as Shakespeare says in Midsummer Night's Dream, create a uh, a dream so as we're wrapping up here i kind of want to do follow up a little bit to what she had just said yeah um is there or has there been the dream role that you've always wanted to do and have you ever any of you actually been able to do it stage or screen no no i haven't actually done it i've done hamlet four times i've never played hamlet played claudius twice Played Laertes once with oh with good actors too with Chris Walken I did Laertes, uh, Claudius with Mark Rylance who's an English actor who's now yes. doing a lot of American films, uh, I did Claudius with a young actor named Ben Reed who people may hear of sometime I did this a couple of years ago, I would love to have played Hamlet and when I'm driving from Columbus Ohio where I live to Buffalo and then on to Niagara Falls I'll I'll do bits and pieces of the play to myself, just to entertain myself, because I'm still, many years later, yeah. finding I'll never get to play Hamlet. I did Romeo and Juliet when I was 
a youngster and uh, did it quite, quite a, I thought it was quite good. And that somebody just, uh, I did it in Riverside Boat Basin in New York and about 40 people saw it. But one of those 40 people came up to me at uh, Chiller in New Jersey a month ago and said, I saw you do Romeo and Juliet with Kate Burton and it was the best Romeo I've ever seen and I've seen a lot of them. So I've done that. And I have this idea for a production of Romeo and Juliet where you do an 80-year-old Romeo and an 80-year-old Juliet, or an 80-year-old Romeo and a 78-year-old Juliet, at the end of their life and do it as a memory play, how they're remembering how they met and how they fell in love and how their love died, but they're still together 50 I, years later, I, 60 years, 70 I like years that. later. I like that treatment a lot. It's an interesting concept. So maybe I'll get to play Romeo again. <laughs> So, but Hamlet's the one that's always eluded you. Okay. Hamlet's the one that's always eluded me. Yeah, I'd love to do Hamlet. Well, I want to thank you for coming to do this. So thank, thank you. you guys for and coming thank out. you guys. Thanks a lot. Make sure that you visit Mark at his table. You can talk to him directly, ask him more questions, right. ask him more about his tough time as the, as the master on Buffy. Um, you're here today and tomorrow for the whole day. I'm here so tomorrow too, yeah. Make sure that you go and visit him and say hi and, you know, maybe buy a picture or two. Sure. Thanks again, money, guys. Money have a great uh, Comic Con. Thank you, guys. Thank you for watching. What? Did you really fall on the marbles? No, I don't fall on the marbles. I got ahead of them. My oh, soldiers right, did. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, about that. I just love the fact that the sister video that Stephen Furr finally got his sparky with the seltzer. You shot the seltzer out of his I shot the seltzer out of his hand. Yeah, that was the, for the second one they brought him in. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 Niagara Falls Comic Con. Please like, comment and subscribe to see more, and let us know below what you think of this video. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.